On October 4th, 2022, the US government announced 200 Max Pro MRAP vehicles were being sent to Ukraine as part of a new $625 million aid package. This armored vehicle's unique development story takes us through the biggest change in America's defense equipment strategy since World War II. And we'll see, many would argue that in hindsight, it was a giant waste of money and a short-sighted decision to produce. While others maintain it's responsible for saving thousands of lives. The MRAP has even recently changed the appearance of the civilian police force in the United States. Thank God that won't be controversial at all. So what are the right ways and wrong ways to deploy it in a combat zone? And will this vehicle be a good fit for large-scale armored combat that's happening in Ukraine? So the start of the MRAP story begins in a very unlikely place. We can trace its roots back 40 years before their eventual integration into the US military. It started during the South African border war between 1966 and 1990. South Africa at the time was fighting against an insurgency that made use of these hit and run ambush style attacks. They used triple stacked old Soviet TM-57 mines to cut through South Africa's armored vehicles. So the South African police asked their Council for Scientific and Industrial Research to pretty please develop a purpose-built vehicle that could transport a whole squad of two crew plus 12 soldiers in the back, all while being bullet and mine resistant. Hey, maybe even add a cup holder and I don't know, some air conditioning while you're at it? The four-wheeled Casper was designed starting in 1979, where it underwent two years of experimental testing. It ended up having a very unique design, unusual for armored vehicles of the time. There was a large standoff distance of a few feet between the ground and the hole to increase the distance between the mine and the raised up crew, which greatly reduced the effectiveness of the mine, which isn't meant to strike targets further than a few feet away. The added weight did make the thing a bigger target, but it's well worth the trade-off if you ask me. It was given a V-shaped underbelly angled hole to deflect the incoming blast. This paper I found by the International Journal of Protective Structures studied the effects of blast radius against shaped V-holes. They stated that previous versions of mine-resistant vehicles prior to this had too steep of an angle, which raised the center of gravity and increased the chances of tipping over. So it's always been this trade-off here between driver stability versus protection. The optimal angle based on testing appeared to be about 120 degrees. Angling armor increases the amount of material that the projectile must pass through in order to penetrate. This means you can angle a steel plate and increase its protection without doing anything else with it. Panzer World has an online calculator where you can determine the effective protection of an angled armor if you're into math and numbers like that. In 1981, the South African police placed an initial small order of 141 with the local manufacturer called Henred Fureff. Once it became clear how effective they were in combat, production was ramped up and since then over 2,800 have been built. You might already recognize the Casper from my favorite sci-fi film, District 9. But even when the British defense company BAE Systems acquired the Casper in 2004, they were still relatively unknown for a vehicle and certainly they weren't on the United States military's radar yet in any meaningful way. So why did America end up needing the MRAP? In 2004, at the start of the insurgency in Iraq, the enemy fought in a very similar way to the insurgents that the South African army faced off against in the 1980s. Iraqi insurgents preferred to use improvised explosive devices constructed from old Soviet era artillery shells buried under the road and linked by a wire to a remote control detonator. According to a case study by the Center for Public Policy on MRAPs, ID attacks on coalition troops posed the single greatest risk. In fact, they accounted for 70% of US combat casualties and they easily destroyed the American Humvees that troops used. So wait a second, why didn't America just use their heavily armored M2 Bradley and M1 Abrams that could probably survive the IED attacks better? Well, those tracked vehicles required too much maintenance and high logistics costs to use in the role of a daily routine security patrol that racked up thousands of miles. The occupation was turning out to be a very different set of requirements needed than the invasion. Most troops had to patrol around in the 12,000 lightly armored Humvees in the country that offered no protection against IEDs. To make matters worse, apparently Iraqis weren't too stoked on the invasion. A government accountability office report stated that by June 2006, IED attacks had reached more than 2,000 per month. 
Soldiers scrambled to weld improvised sheet metal onto the sides of vehicles as makeshift armor fixes. This visual is very reminiscent of Russian soldiers attempting to ghetto rig their own vehicles with wood and steel armor. The Department of Defense developed a two-pronged approach to fight the threat of IEDs in Iraq. The first was elevating a small army unit to the Joint IED Defeat Organization. This task force was studying and developing tactics to combat IEDs. Great, glad to see we've got the bean counters and the pencil pushers nice and busy. The second approach started in 2003 when the DoD built up new armored Humvees and armor kits for already deployed vehicles. Sorry we sent you to war in death traps, whoops. These efforts did have a significant impact. IED effectiveness decreased over 50% early in the war to less than 10% in late 2007, but it didn't fully solve the problem. The Humvees Up Armor program only produced about half of the requested numbers of vehicles, and the engines weren't powerful enough to handle the added weight of the heavy armor. I've driven around in those up-armored Humvees and you start to feel like you're in a struggle bus when you try to accelerate. At the same time, an extremely lethal version of IED started popping up called explosive form penetrators. EFP shape charges only accounted for 5-10% to of attacks, but they were out there causing 40% of casualties. These things were by far my greatest fear when I deployed, well other than being stuck on ship burning detail again. There were also a unit cohesion problem presented by Humvees because they weren't really designed for frontline combat. Humvees only fit 5 soldiers or a single fire team which splits up the squad and force soldiers into more crew roles stuck on the vehicle. The MRAP had room for a whole maneuver squad in the back of the vehicle, allowing for easier dismounted operations that are key to counterinsurgency missions. Something still had to be done. Enter Force Protection Inc., founded in 2002. They were originally a speedboat company, but they said, f it, that champagne luxury lifestyle isn't for us. Let's invest in what's popping right now. So a little after 9-11, they were in a position where they were already creating armored vehicles based on the Casper design that they had secured from South African military. In 2004, the United States Marine Corps first requested an order of mine-resistant vehicles, and within six months, their first prototype was finished. Originally, it was called the Cougar, and in April 2004, the Marines fielded the first 27 units. The Cougar differed in a lot of ways compared to the Casper, including having two additional wheels and more powerful of an engine to help balance out an additional 40,000 pounds of heavy armor. Reports from these Marines on the front lines showed that the Cougars survived 300 IED strikes with zero casualties. I like those odds. But switching fully to the MRAP was like pulling teeth for the Army, because the vehicle went against everything the military was trying to achieve behind the scenes at the time. Damn stubborn US Army, why don't you do what's good for you? The MRAP was at odds with the Army's biggest vision of becoming a lightweight, quickly deployable force. The MRAP was too heavy to fit into this philosophy. The vehicle weighed about 60,000 pounds or 30 tons, which is twice that of an up-armored Humvee. So the Army was resisting this switch even though it might have been necessary. The vehicle really is towering. It comes in at 10 feet tall, 8.25 feet wide, and 23 feet long, but the top speed on level road of about 70 miles per hour. This thing flies. The US version was created with all of NATO's armor and weapon standards and requirements in mind. It had a remote controlled thermal weapon station that could be fitted with any weapon of your choosing from a 50 caliber machine gun to a Mark 19 automatic grenade launcher, dealer's choice. From tests that we've seen of the vehicle online, it appears that the armor can stop 50 caliber rounds as long as they're not armor piercing munitions, which will go right through. The US military certainly knew about and were aware of the MRAP's capabilities. It boasted a 400 percent increase in troop protection over the Humvee. Troops were 10 times more likely to survive an attack in them. So the first official order of MRAPs was on February 17, 2005, from Deputy Commanding General, 1st Marine Expeditionary Force, asking for an urgent universal needs statement of over 1,000 MRAPs. This urgent needs request is a way to accelerate something and cut through all of the red tape bullshit bureaucracy of the government. And it was necessary because at the time the US was losing an average of a little more than two soldiers per day that same year. The Army, not one to miss a chance to copy the Marines' uniforms or vehicles, put in their own request a little while later and the race for the MRAP was on. 
Force Protection, the small independent defense company, found themselves in this golden position where they were at the front line of the supply line. Their stock soared at the time from pennies to $30, and they were doing $1.3 billion in annual sales. But their monopoly on the MRAP would be short-lived. Because of the urgent nature of the rushed orders for both US military branches, the vehicle needed to be manufactured by multiple contractors. BAE, General Dynamics, Oshkosh, and Textron made deals with Force Protection to use their MRAP designs. These trucks had almost zero development time, and the rate at which they were being produced is touted at being the largest and fastest industrial mobilization since World War II. Wait, isn't anyone going to stop to ask if we're going to still need these vehicles after we pull out of Iraq and Afghanistan and stop fighting against unarmored opponents? Stop asking questions, these wars will never end. By 2007, there were still less than 2,000 MRAPs deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan. Former Secretary of Defense Robert Gates wrote a memoir called Duty, detailing the internal politics that prevented the MRAP from going into widespread service earlier in the war. In it, he says, Every delay of a single day costs one or more of our kids his life or limb. To my chagrin, not a single senior official, civilian or military, supported my proposal to buy thousands of these vehicles. On the same day, he issued a directive to make the MRAP program, quote, the Pentagon's highest priority. And within 18 months after that, more than 10,000 of the MRAPs had been fielded. Gates' directive became the catalyst that pushed MRAP production into full throttle, with each unit costing between $500,000 and $1 million. Nearly $50 billion was invested into the MRAP program, and by the end of the wars, over 24,000 had been produced. So for some context on just how much of the Army's budget that eats up, we can see in 2008, about $162 billion was earmarked for procurement. However, with the benefit of hindsight, we still have to ask ourselves, was this the right decision? There were many unintended costs with this switch that the defense industry is feeling to this day. The $50 billion investment came at the cost of dropping other priorities like the Army's future combat systems acquisition that was aiming to replace the M2 Bradley and the M1 Abrams with lightweight robotic tanks. Orders for Javelin anti-tank and Stinger missile systems were sidelined during this time. Was it short-sighted to invest in a heavy armored truck best suited for counterinsurgency, low-intensity roles if a near-peer conflict is back in the cards only a few years later. Once the Iraq and Afghanistan wars started to slow down by 2015, the military woke up with a headache from a $50 billion spending binge. According to the Center for Strategic Business and Budgetary Assessments, the US Army estimates that it will need to spend millions of dollars to destroy and get rid of 7,400 MRAPs that it no longer needs. All the different branches are trying to get rid of as many MRAPs as possible at this point, even going so far as to shred thousands in Afghanistan instead of even trying to send them home. They had buyer's remorse real bad and thought to themselves, what are we gonna do with all these armored trucks now that we have to prepare for a tank-on-tank -tank fight with China? I don't know, give them to the, the cops or something. A new tool in the Memphis Police Department's arsenal, a massive military style vehicle that may look more menacing than it really is. The MRAP found a new home. Surplus vehicles were transferred to the United States civilian police departments for free using the 1033 program that allows law enforcement agencies around the United States to acquire excess military equipment that would otherwise be destroyed. As of July, 2020, about 1,059 MRAPs have been transferred to police agencies. This has raised the question about the militarization of police. Or it could be the media's misunderstanding of these armored vehicles and their whole original point. The MRAP is, after all, originally based on a South African police vehicle, and without the mounted grenade launcher or 50 caliber machine gun, it really doesn't have any teeth and it's relegated to a defensive role. Since January 1st, 2016, law enforcement agencies have seen a record 129% increase in violence and attacks, according to the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund. Police and SWAT cars up until now have had zero armor and bullets cut through them like Swiss cheese, which arguably should have been made bulletproof years ago. On the other hand, if you take one look at how some police SWAT teams look today, it's hard to deny that they're starting to look 
more indistinguishable from military soldiers in some cases. There are interesting arguments on both sides for sure, and if you're interested, I think the topic deserves its own video. How you feel about the police officers acquiring the MRAP will likely have to do with where you fall on the pro-police spectrum, which is why I say give them main battle tanks, but it seems to me there are some interesting arguments on both sides though. So the MRAP is great against an insurgency, but what about against the traditional army? Well, mines are certainly a factor in Ukraine. We've seen plenty of evidence of anti-tank mines and booby traps being placed by both sides, and the MRAP would most likely be a good option for advancing across terrain laden with explosives. The high mobility of the vehicle across muddy, swampy terrain will be very beneficial for the Ukrainian military, but the height of the vehicle does make its center of gravity more prone to rollovers, which could make it a liability for crossing harsh river terrain as we've seen here. But much of the armor on armor engagements will see the MRAP's biggest disadvantage being that it will be outgunned. The vehicles sent to Ukraine are largely without any weapon systems on it, so it appears Ukraine will have to find armaments for themselves, and so the MRAP loses one of its greatest strengths here without the remote controlled weapon station on top. I think this limits the MRAP to being best used as transporting infantry to the front lines and trying to avoid sustained combat, but I wouldn't rule out Ukraine surprising us with how they end up using the vehicle. Thank you for watching this episode. If you liked it, please hit the like button and subscribe. You're watching Task and Purpose. I'm Chris Cappy, your former average infantryman.